Amen. I believe that many of you, if not all of you, will be familiar with the story of Sisyphus, the king of Ephra, from the Greek mythology. He was proud, and because of the fact that he was proud, he was punished by the gods. And his punishment was to roll a heavy boulder uphill, but you see, he never reached the top. Each time when he just about reached the top, that boulder slipped from his hands and rolled downhill, and then Sisyphus had to start all over again. It was like a cycle that repeated itself, and it was never ending, and that was the essence of his punishment. And Jesus saw those around him who were just like Sisyphus, they tried, and they tried, and they tried. They wanted to do something for their own future. They want to do something to secure their lives, but they would never succeed. And it was those people that he addressed in Matthew chapter 11. And this chapter deals with the doubts of John the Baptist, because you will remember that he sent some of his messengers to go and ask Jesus, are you the one that we expected, or should we wait for another one? Are you the one? And then there was the hypocrisy of the religious leaders, and then there was the wickedness of the people in all of the towns where Jesus preached the gospel, and then those who committed themselves to Jesus, those who said, I will follow you wherever you take me, they witnessed all those things, and they must have wondered if there would ever be peace that would come in their lives. For that, they had just too much turmoil in their lives. But still, they wore themselves down in trying to do something, trying to get somewhere in their own personal lives. Isn't this passage so relevant to the world, the time that we live in? Because we still, on a daily basis, see the people like Sisyphus doing again and again and again that which is impossible. The things that they will never succeed in. Yes, we see the same concerns as what the people had in Jesus' time. The circumstances are just different. We see, we hear about countries like Pakistan and Nigeria where Christians are persecuted. We are aware of discrimination in basically all facets of life. In the United States, there was a president of a student council removed because his Christian principles made too many people uncomfortable, and they decided to replace him with someone who was more neutral, someone who was more inclusive to all people. And I don't have to tell you that many Christian leaders find so many obstacles in just trying to do God's work. In many churches, their members are just not getting into movement. They are so reluctant to help, so reluctant to get involved. They always wait for someone else to do the work. And then, in many places, there is zero tolerance. In a secular world, I asked before the service began, are you tired? Do you feel the fatigue? And I think it's just so human to feel fatigue when you hear all these things that I just mentioned. We are only human beings. We are not super 
human beings and we get worn down by all these things and it caused so many people to decide I cannot do this, I'm going to throw it the white towel, I just cannot do this I will never forget this about a week before I graduated from seminary and I was certified for ministry I had a conversation with a man at the steel firm where I worked as a student. And he asked me if that was where I was going to build a career. And I said, no, I'm graduating from seminary. And I hope soon to enter ministry after I completed my military service. And he looked at me and he said, I would think twice if I were you. I had a nervous breakdown. There was no joy to me in ministry. I became a minister just like you feel called to be a minister. I had that calling. But I never found joy. And by the grace of God, there were trying times, but here I am still preaching the gospel. I'm so grateful for that. And you, when you feel fatigued, when you sit in your pew and you think about this, I just can't keep up. I just don't know how much longer I can keep up with the challenges of life. I don't know how much longer I can do the things that God would expect from me to do. I don't know how much longer I can keep up with the things in my personal family life. Then Jesus comes just as over 2,000 years ago and He makes this Wonderful invitation. Come to me, you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. You know, to me it sounds like a symphony. I can just listen again and again to these words of Jesus. I can just replay it. And I think of this so often, this invitation. Come to me. You who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. But there are some conditions in this invitation. In conditions that you and I have to really take to heart. And the first is, come to Jesus. You see, the words, come to me, doesn't mean come to Buddhism or Confucianism or to Hinduism, or to Islam. Because, friends, it's so popular what people say these days, and we see this on television in all these shows that they have, and someone would go public and say, you know what, it doesn't matter whether you're a Christian, whether you're a Hindu, whether you're a Muslim, it just doesn't matter as long as you meditate, as long as you just think, as long as you follow the teachings You will be fine, because in the end, everything will just come together. And then we say, no. Because no prophet, no leader from any other faith would hold the key to success and to the future. There is no other prophet or leader or master, whatever they want to call them, that would give us peace and solace. It is only Jesus Christ, the one sent by the Father, Jesus our peace, that can bring peace in the hearts of people, that brought peace and understanding and forgiveness to God's people when they wandered in darkness. He is the only solution, the only one. You see, Jesus thought of of one thing, it's just him. And then he would say to, don't come to your own orchestrated plan for the future. Because people say, well, I just have to live my dreams. I know exactly where I'm going. But, you know, if we agree with that, we too will file with those people. And come to me doesn't mean, well, you just can come to your career or you can come to your friends and you will find the answers. As I say, Jesus thought of one thing. In fact, 
of one person. He thought of himself, that he's the only answer, the way, the truth, and the life. Period. There's nothing to be added unto that. And you know Scripture so well. Hebrews 4, verses 15 and 16 is an affirmation that it can only be Jesus. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who was tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of God's grace with confidence and receive mercy and find grace in the time of our need. Can you appreciate with me how essential it is to accept this invitation of Jesus and that for some people this invitation is not just to give them rest when they are fatigued, but that would perhaps be that time when they find salvation in the Savior of the world. The time when they see the light that has gone up for them and that they can appreciate the answer, the solution. But again and again and again, you and I can accept this invitation because we can, we can find rest in Jesus. We can find affirmation. You will agree with me that many people in this world regret it, how they missed out on great life opportunities. That they just thought, but how could I miss that? And this one I want to share with you it was years ago in Belgium where a lady gave up her apartment as she was moving into a care home. And she knocked at the door of her young neighbor, a young man in his 20s. And with excitement, she said, I have a picture that I want to give to you. They told me that it's worth a lot. But this young man was a bit agitated and he refused the painting and he slammed the door on this lady. And about a month later, he learned that someone else in that apartment building received a Van Gogh painting from that lady and it was worth over five million dollars. And when that young man learned that, he put his face in his hands and he cried out, how could I have missed out on such an opportunity? Friends, it will be far worse for people at the end of time, at the judgment throne, when they would think, I did not Listen, I did not accept the invitation from Jesus. And more than once, this invitation came to me. Why did I refuse this offer from Jesus? My life could have been so much different. Yes, we all have to be sure that we accepted that invitation. Just, just for personal rest and peace in Jesus, but that we came to Him, the Savior of our lives. Jesus talked about fatigue. That's the second point of our sermon, the presence of fatigue. He said, those of you who are weary and burdened, and in some other translations we read about the term heavy laden. So what Jesus wanted to emphasize was that you are pulled down by something like fatigue when you are weary, when you are burdened. And you and I need to acknowledge that from time to time we feel fatigue, we feel burdened. We feel weary. And to Jesus, there was one cause of that. And that's something that he mentioned so often when he preached about the good news to people. It was sin that caused people 
you feel so pulled down by life situations, you feel so burdened, you feel so weary. And therefore he had John the Baptist going before him to preach the message, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. You know, so many people don't realize that guilt can drag you down quite a bit. And I don't want to say that there are not other reasons to feel fatigued. But some people don't realize that it's guilt that's putting them down. They would go from one doctor to the other doctor because of the chronic fatigue syndrome. And they don't realize they can rest as much as they want. It will still be there until that moment when Jesus would restore your life, that He would cleanse your heart, that He would give you peace as only He can give peace. And in His time, Jesus had to restore the hearts of people, so many people. He had to take the guilt away. There was the woman at the well of Jacob, Jesus knew that there was guilt because when he told her, go and get your husband and come back, she said, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, it's true what you just said. You don't have a husband. You had five husbands. And the man that you are with now is not your husband. She needed restoration. She needed that guilt to be removed. And then there was Thomas. He stumbled in the dark back alleys of Jerusalem because of his doubts, because of his sin. And then poor Peter. We always mention Peter. Is it not true that perhaps we pick too much on Peter? I see there's a Peter smiling. That we always mention Peter. At the Sea of Galilee, Jesus restored him. Jesus knew that he had this fatigue because of the guilt. Jesus knew exactly how he felt because he denied his Lord. And Jesus knew that he needed that restoration. Jesus knew what all those people, the women, Samaritan women at the well of Jacob, Thomas, Peter, and everyone else, including you and me, what all people needed, what all people still need, and that is to find rest in Him, that there will be again a transformation in our lives, that we can again be revived through the Holy Spirit, and that we can come into a good place in our lives. And how will that happen for us? That is to find effective rest in what Jesus offered. And I will give you rest. Do you want that rest? Then you have come to the right place. Then you will go to the right place in your personal devotional time when you go and lay down your entire life before Jesus. You see, people can go for sleep therapy. And then they would hear someone ask them, you really have to think, what would cause the restlessness in your life? But you see, Jesus can give it to us in a moment. And from verse 28, when we look at the word rest, it is just something so wonderful from the Greek language. It means to refresh or to revive. It means that you can rest after a long day of labor or after a long journey. And I know that we might sometimes pretend that everything is so fine in our lives, but I will tell you sometimes I feel that I try so hard to accomplish the work for God, and then I feel that I don't have any impact. I don't make a difference anymore. And then I need that affirmation. And you need that affirmation when we labor in God's service. And we don't see the results. Then Jesus tells us, 
I'm going to change that. I want you to take the baggage, what you carry, including your guilt and your sins. And I want you to place it in front of the cross. You don't need to carry that. In the New Testament, in many contexts, rest had the meaning of the change falling off someone's hand. And Jesus tells us, let's just take those chains off. Because you can't go forward, you can't go backwards. We need to remove those chains. We need to restore your whole being, your whole life. Do you want to do that? Friends, you all know what the porters of years back looked like with the wooden frames they had on their backs and what they carried on those frames, sometimes even furniture, and they had carpet rugs, and they had so many things. And then when you look at those pictures, you would just ask yourself, but how was it possible for someone to carry that load? But you know, spiritually, that might just be the same with us. And Jesus tells us, but I want to give you rest. I want you to remove all these burdens. I want to restore your whole life. You see, each day we have to come to Jesus. Each day He would say, I will restore you. I will lead you to the green pastures. I will guide you to the waters. I will change the situation in your life. Do you want this? Do you want this with me? You want to say, there is a solution. And that is our rest in Jesus. Let us accept this. Let us not hesitate. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus,